Hi, this is Privateer Station, and today we'll bring you day 339 of Russian invasion into Ukraine. As always, in a conversational format between Alexei Rostovich, former advisor to the office of the President of Ukraine, and Mark Fagan, Russian opposition politician. Enjoy. Dear friends, glad to see you all on Fagan Live. It is Saturday, January 28th. Time is 16 minutes past 10 in Kiev. 16 minutes past 11 in Moscow. Apologies for that technical delay. I'm traveling and we've been having some issues while I'm on the road. So we're starting a bit late. Today, day 339 with Alexey Rostovich. Hello, Alexey. Good evening, Mark. We have uh, 132,000 people watching us. 42,000 clicked the like button. Uh, please uh, continue sharing links to that stream in your social media so that those who might have uh, abandoned waiting for us at the usual time might come back and join us again. And do not forget to subscribe. Uh, also, subscribe to Privateer Station as well uh, if you have not done that yet and you are watching that in English. All right, let's start with uh, the following news. First of all, um, let's touch upon the situation on the front. There were notes today that uh, attack near Ugledar was repelled and uh, Russian uh, attacking maneuvers were stopped. Can you tell us more? Sergei Shrivati, representative of the Eastern Group of our front. He said that Togledar was uh, shelled 299 times with uh, artillery and uh, reactive artillery. However, I think it's uh, probably mortars, because uh, if it was a real uh, reactive artillery, there probably would be nothing left of Ugledar. So, according to the statements of our military, the enemy failed to advance. There are some videos uh, surfacing of Russian military uh, servicemen killed during their attacks of Solidar. So, that also means that Solidar is still in our control because, or at least the area around it, because. Um, these videos uh, usually surface when uh, we still hold the positions. And you can see on those, it's uh, infantry creeping up as a small detachment, probably a platoon size, uh, very rarely more than 10 people together. So. Now they don't use artillery, they don't have that advantage, they keep throwing manpower at uh, our trenches. And I will also want to make a note here that the Pacific uh, detachment of Russian Marines, uh, they're not even close to those psychological attacks of Wagner, uh, so they did not really move anywhere. At the same time, we're not just observing them. A lot of uh, things happen to these guys trying to sneak up in our positions. Uh, they usually miserably fail, and if any of them is left, they have to retreat. So I uh, called two key points, Solidar area and uh, Ugledar. We can also mention Kherson region, where they tried to shell the city, and we countered their positions uh, in Zaporozhye. There have been six aerial attacks, probably helicopters, 81 artillery attacks. There was also a missile uh, strike on Konstantinovka today where some people died on our side. Preliminary they used S-300 missile. Hard to tell in the picture, it seems to have hit between two houses and 
civilians died. Uh, the local authorities are saying that three people died and two are wounded. That's the story. So, something like that. We again have civilians dying. Two men, uh, 30, 36, and 76 year old retiree. They're still not uh, calling the number of wounded because that number still grows. They uh, hit civilian buildings the residential uh, buildings so they're still digging out the uh, wounded and counting the numbers all right thank you alexei we have about two hundred and twelve thousand having joined us um let's talk about wagner and prigozhin and the conflict surrounding that figure right now and what uh, can we uh, link on the front to the development of that conflict. That uh, story with Girkin is not exactly as straightforward. He, in his uh, streams, uh, announced many times that he wanted to partake in the war on the front, and he even tried, if you remember, to sneak to the front, but wasn't led to. And uh, Wagner basically caught him at his statement and said, oh, come here, we'll, uh, we'll have a, an AK for you. So it appears that Prigozhin is a person who is uh, consciously provoking these conflicts in a public sphere with uh, somewhat popular public figures. Does it uh, have an influence on the situation on, uh, by the situation on the front? Does Wagner lose more people, get less support now? So. Do you think these conflicts that he relentlessly keeps firing up uh, provoke any consequences on the front? Uh, no, Mark. This is a, a so-called ultra-right uh, infighting in Russia, and that's uh, Prigozhin, uh, Prigozhin and Wagner attack on uh, other uh, opponents uh, in the media field. And when things are going a little uh, worse on the front than they were before, he needed to look for a figure to attack. He uh, definitely went down in ranks. He could not uh, attack Gerasimov anymore. Uh, and he picked uh, Strelkov. So he kind of went down in scale. And... In any case, uh, he keeps promoting a special uh, system that Wagner is using on the front. So, in some sense, this is a derivative of that uh, criminal culture merged with some sort of military background that uh, council of commanders after which you you can only become a, be awarded uh, at the meeting of the commanders and um, if you fail on the front there'll be a council of commanders that uh, will be treating you and addressing uh, if you're a coward if you did that right so that's kind of smells with criminal uh, proceedings not with uh, real military and um, he just con continues to popularize the system of relations in Wagner and um, wants more people to join, but I uh, don't think he's having too much success. There is also a theory that Wagner is conflicting with uh, FSB in face of Strelkov, uh, which uh, supposedly is backing him up. But I think conflict with FSB is not really on the agenda for Wagner, because that uh, size of a conflict would not uh, end well for them. As for FSB really backing up Strelkov to be defending him to forming his position, if he was uh, really tightly embedded with FSB, they would not, I think, let that conflict happen or would have uh, extinguished it really rapidly. And since it existed for at least four days and brought up a lot of uh, brownish water to the surface, 
I think if Girkin was uh, a serious uh, representative of FSB, uh, there would be some voice uh, interjecting into that quarrel and stopping them and Apparently, it ha didn't happen. So, Girkin had to defend his own position. It was not the easiest position to defend because he's somewhere between I want to go fight uh, today and uh, the second I'm not going to fight with uh, within Wagner because uh, you guys mistreat people. So, it's a little not comfortable uh, position to be in to uh, defend and uh, yeah his opponents uh, pointed fingers at that and said you two are in a very weird position and I th don't think this uh, quarrel has uh, long-lasting consequences this is just one of the anecdotes of this war in my opinion like uh, classic Saltykov Shadrin where two guys uh, have uh, quarreled with each other yeah Evgeny Viktorovich uh, that's his uh, patronymic okay um yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, I mislabeled him. I thought of a different uh, movie character. Today, there was also a statement made by the, our president. He specifically pointed towards tragedy in Konstantinovka with the death of civilians and said that Ukraine needs missiles, long range missiles, to be able to counter such attacks, pointing finger at uh, S 300s, S 400s. Uh, at the extreme uh, distance, they are beyond the reach of HIMARS. This is not a parity war in this case, because we keep having big tragedies, small tragedies, although even the death of one person is a big tragedy, really. And very often we cannot suppress the launch sites that Russia uses. S-300s, which are destined for attack, uh, designed for uh, Earth to surface to surface attacks, and then S-400s converted for their needs as well. This is an attempt of an equivalent to HIMARS, but S-300s they shoot further than HIMARS do, and uh, they fly on the ballistic trajectory. The only problem, the difference with HIMARS, is that HIMARS is very precise. If it hits the target towards the target, it hits it. Well, S-300 can deviate up to 150 meters yards away from the target. This is not a precise weapon. This is uh, definitely a general area of attack weapon. And they are using them on civilian targets, on towns and cities. And we need some tools to be able to suppress them. When they, they, they're shooting at a distance further than we have our reach now. Remember when they've been attacking Nikolaev while they had Kherson region occupied? They've been hitting Nikolaev daily with those S-300s and we could not counter that. We just didn't have anything to reach them that far. We're not even talking about the parity with uh, cruise missiles, but at least with S-300s, that would be nice to have, because otherwise it's very difficult to solve issues of civilian population with an enemy who indiscriminately is shooting at civilian targets. And uh, representatives of our leadership are doing uh, conducting negotiations with the West, and I think there are two last milestones, uh, two last red lines left missiles and long-range artillery and uh, aviation jets which have not been crossed yet but i think we'll cross those soon sorry to interrupt you no it's okay there is some information that um, britain and poland are going to provide ukraine cruise missiles uh, storm shadow missiles which have a significant distance, significant reach, and I understand they're uh, being carried by jets as a platform, and uh, these weapons can create uh, parity in this case. Do you think a solution of that scale can help Ukraine to resolve this issue, even uh, 
not waiting for the United States. It's a bit difficult to comment on that. I can just say that Brits are very independent. Uh, they can, of course, make decisions uh, regardless of United States position. But um, the difficulty here comes from a different thing, is that this is more of a rumor at this point. Um, it's easier to comment when it becomes news and is confirmed by public officials. So for now I can say this probably will go the same road, route as uh, tanks, as HIMARS. We'll never give that to you, that's uh, off limits, down to, okay, let's give them more because they're effective. And as a side note, next Rammstein that happens on uh, February 14th, on the Valentine's Day, is uh, unofficially called Aviation Rammstein, so I think there is a reason for that. And uh, our Air Force is uh, expecting something like 24 jets uh, from that Rammstein uh, that may come to fruition. And depends which uh, modification of that uh, jet comes. F-16 is a very multifunctional vehicle. But uh, roughly, and again, this is a very rough comparison, one F-16 can uh, be an equivalent of four HIMARS. Plus, HIMARS cannot uh, solve tasks that F-16s can. Plus, they, those usually joint work together. They'll be provided not as single jets, but as a system of weapons. So, there'll be a good uh, trumping card to finish off the Russian group here in Ukraine. Because we, their forces definitely cannot uh, fight with modern uh, Western aviation. Yeah, speaker already said... Uh, that there is no official confirmation of the number of jets, and he also mentioned that we 24 is not enough, we need 108. So, yeah, I agree. We need five brigades, that basically covers the whole territory. But even if, if, if we get 24 to start with, this is a very strong story. And by the long reach and the precision and the multifunctionality, they are very versatile weapon. It will be similar to tanks. This Rammstein, next Rammstein, we will eventually get that support. Because I would remind our viewers that on the first Rammstein, there was a decision made to fully refit Ukrainian army uh, to the NATO standards. And uh, they gave it a couple of years and the situation is uh, changing in our favor. Here's another thing that we can talk about. I think uh, the topic of uh, artillery shells. This is an aggregator that shows a real situation on the front quite well. Uh, look here. So, right now, the average number of shots from the Russian sides at our targets uh, is uh, about 15,000 shots per day. It uh, sometimes uh, fluctuates upwards, but usually it's somewhere between 10 to 15. And that was uh, before that, at the beginning of the war, they've been shooting 45, 60,000 shots daily. So right now their number of uh, artillery attacks and shots fired it dwindled down thrice. So they have a huge artillery hunger. And given that in Russian or Soviet, uh, ex-Soviet army, Artillery is the main component, aviation is the secondary. Their main attacking force is artillery, and that model requires, their model of fighting requires artillery. And if you see uh, also on the ground where their artillery shells were used before, now they are using infantry. And those small creepers by a platoon or so, uh, that's to replace the infantry shellings. Now the next question, can they replenish? their stock of shells by forcing their uh, military industrial complex to produce more? This is an open question, but I think they will face serious issues trying to achieve that goal. And now let's see what the West is saying. For example, German uh, Rain Metal Group, one of the manufacturers of Leopards, uh, announced that they were planning to increase their production. They are saying they can produce 240,000 uh, shells for tanks. This is more than the whole world needs annually. 
and artillery shells can be 452 millimeter howitzers can be increased up to 400,000 per year. And that's just one group. Uh, Europe before that was producing 300,000 annually, and there is also America. America recently announced that they can increase their shell production by up to 600 percent. So the world is uh, waking up, and they understand. They start to understand whom they're dealing with. And Russian side is now facing a very uncomfortable alternative. In uh, short term, in several months, really, really short term, uh, they can uh, change places with the Ukrainian army. In the situation that happened in May, June, July, that we faced back last year, they may find themselves that they can shoot back maybe 10,000 a day, but uh, they get shot at uh, at a quadruple rate of that. And what to do with that model? Russian army doesn't know. It could only fight and mass. And that famous phrase by Stalin, quantity is uh, quality by itself. But even using mass, they take skill. And how do you fight when there are fewer of you against a technically more advanced foe? They have no solution to that. This is a way, a path, one way ticket for them. They they cannot turn that. And that machine on the West that is starting up is uh, gradually leading to that situation where Russian military will find themselves in a technological minority not uh, only quantitatively, but also qualitatively. And they don't have tactics or working models how to deal with that. And they do not have capability to sharply increase the production of ammo. So that's the story. Also, tanks. According to the beginning of the war stats, they had about 1,300 tanks. Uh, sorry, they they had 300, uh, 3,500 tanks at the beginning. Uh, our general command is saying that we destroyed 3,200, so almost all of them. They are lifting 15,000 from conservation, but uh, they can maybe bring 20% out of uh, 15,000 that are conserved, and by mostly by meaning of cannibalizing the spare parts from the others. So maybe in a year they can bring 3,000. Uh, if they bring them to the front, we understand that it'll be easier to keep destroying them with these new tools, new vehicles provided by Rammstein. And so the second major component that they use tank detachments is in a very difficult position in uh, Russian military. Today it's a common place where their tank battalion only has 10-15 tanks out of 30 instead of 30. Or instead of 30 armored carrying, uh, personnel carrying vehicles, they have maybe 10-15. And according to some additional data that needs more verification, but uh, we're already seeing some reports that in some new refitted brigades, uh, they are disappearing tank detachments. So instead of a tank battalion, they only have a tank company in a detachment. So those who served in the military, those who are professional military, they understand that this whole invasion story was based on strong uh, factors of Russian artillery and Russian tanks units, which are both at a very weak position now. So discussions between Kremlin and Russian military are happening in a flow that maybe we should abandon our offensive attempts. Perhaps uh, we should try to fortify and hold what we have with all the mobilized and all. Of course, political leadership will insist on offensive. They will still send troops to Konstantinovka, Kupiansk, probably Liman. And they still have plans to the end of February, beginning of March. And they need to keep doing that while the soil is still wet and our tanks are not fast. But uh, this, everybody understands, this is just uh, 
a short-term strategy. There is no exit here. Uh, there is a dead end. And even if, imagine, we have to withdraw a little somewhere, we'll hold the front, we'll not retreat uh, 150 kilometers. It'll be small tactical maneuvering. And then with uh, reinforced by Western weapons and uh, freshly arrived and trained troops, we'll uh, start our operations. At that moment, they, their troops will be wasted. They'll be morally tired and they'll be running out of uh, shells and armor. And it may happen that Kharkov operation may show, may, may appear to be a very uh, small scale compared to what uh, may unfold in May or June. Because a proposition to stop a tank battalion without artillery or other tanks, um, that is a very sad situation for the defenders. That's why all these conversations about big Russian offensive, the finale of this uh, offensive uh, operation may end up being very different from what Russian military are trying to scare us with. And there are statements made by president, by his officials, and sending it as rumors as well. A real question is the battle worthiness even of an existing group that is fighting with us here. The second group that uh, will come to replace that one when it's gone, um, I don't doubt that they can probably get more people, but I don't think they can outfit them properly. And military are pointing over and over again that they are in a very precarious position. How will that group even be able to attack? What can they do? Uh, in the future, when we'll be switching from defending to offensive maneuvers with Western tanks and uh, Western artillery, and maybe, I don't know, and if aviation and more UAVs come, I don't know twice how they can hold the line. So now, attention, in two, three months, maximum three, four, the destiny of Russian Federation will face a severe fork in their development. And then they have to solve the situation not by uh, posing import importance and trying to convince the foe to sit down at the table of negotiations with you. Uh, their choice will be more like uh, shoot themselves immediately or write a death note before doing that. And also, there is another council happening soon about the prices of oil. And um, I don't think they'll put it down to $40 per barrel, but they can bring it down to 45 and that'll be hurting. Also, yeah, natural gas pricing. They're uh, getting themselves in a very tight news. When we speak about uh, military, we don't have we we should not forget about sanctions. Uh, today, our president signed a document about 185 companies that are affiliated with Russian railroads and related with transportation of uh, Russian military troops. So we're adding more to the scope of the Western uh, following sanctions. So after that fog and mirrors, uh, smoke and mirrors of the big Russian offensive that scared people for the last month or couple of months, I think there is an old law of the jungle that the loudest screamer is the weakest one. And they keep screaming about that offensive so much that I start to really question their capability. And um, they might, they might still continue some offensive operations with the, the resources they have. But I don't know how they're going to st stop us when we switch to offensive. Because of the offensive and defensive maneuvers, one thing when it's a steady front line, another when there is an active offensive operation of your foe, this is when you have to expand, uh, expel, um, actually spend, as much of uh, shells and resources in uh, an hour as required to stop the enemy. And I don't know if they have that number. I don't know if they have enough resource to throw into the fire to stop us in this case. So I don't know what uh, their perspectives are in this case. I don't think they're bright. 
I see a lot of people clicking the like button. Thank you. I see a lot of questions in our chat. As I mentioned, uh, I am on a different continent. This is uh, Africa where I am now. I'm meeting with some people. It is important. Uh, so I apologize for the quality of my picture and uh, yeah, the geographically related. So I'm trying to get by with what I have here. Uh, people saying that Fagin is uh, shining on the Chroma key background. Uh, yeah, I do. I am. This is uh, my travel setup. So we've been about 30 minutes live and we still have a few things to address about the results of elections in Czech Republic. There, uh, a general, a NATO general, Pavel, uh, is uh, his last name. So yeah, Peter Paul. Um, a NATO general becoming a president. An ex uh, prime minister who Whom, whom some some call yeah he's a president right oh sorry yeah I, I mean I was talking about the um, comp his competitor Peter Paul's competitor the guy who was a uh, prime minister who resigned who was um, Babish who might have been more not pro-Russian but uh, holding a somewhat neutral position so he failed these elections and uh, he lost these elections to uh, head of the military NATO military committee um, who is a really big friend of Ukraine and a very ardent supporter of Ukraine and by the way many people I don't know if they know but check Uh, Czech Republic is a very uh, strong country in terms of military production. They produce a lot of military hardware for Europe. So this is an interesting development of European Atlantic Union that uh, on the background of these figures coming to power in other countries, there is still a problem happening with Hungary. The commentary from the leadership of Hungary the last one, they said uh, something about uh, nobody's land. Kiev actually called the ambassador of Hungary and uh, talked him down. But yeah, they did call Ukraine a no man's land, so or nobody's land. So there is a, now there is other rhetoric uh, coming from Hungary saying that they still have to be with uh, European Union but uh, because it's important for Hungary, but we are not appreciated by European Union. Uh, yes, Mark, they actually got some uh, oil uh, quotas cut. They had a tremendous amount of oil being transported from Russia, which allowed them to profiteer on that and then refine that and uh, send it further, sell it further to the EU. Um, right now they are facing a shortage of that resource, uh, enough for their substance, but not enough to sell to anybody. So, yeah, they are screaming about it. And uh, Hungary is also taking a position of torpedoing other uh, harsh sanctions against uh, Russia. So, what do you think are perspectives with Orban in the context of other countries, like uh, Czech Republic, they're getting uh, somewhat more radicalized towards the war that Russia started. I think it's clear, Mark, in Europe, in the NATO countries, in the countries of European Union, politicians who are toying with Russia do not have any future, any political future. Slowly or uh, fastly, they'll come to more and more isolation. And EU and NATO have enough tools to show people and voters of these countries that this politician is uh, lacking perspectives for the country because he is going against, uh, we can start with European values uh, and, and with strategic interests of these countries that are expressed in certain actions and plans. Even the most vegetarian organization cannot afford to conduct politics uh, for the group of people who uh, go against that organization. That can only go so far after which it is being addressed. The number of uh, actions uh, aimed at uh, 
neutralizing or uh, hopefully waking up urban to the reality. So 16 billion of European help are being withheld from Hungary for uh, their signature of uh, joining the European Union uh, in some sanctions against Russia, but after further commentary that amount is not being immediately made available for them. So it's, it's a simple situation. Imagine you and me and there's a big group going to the, I don't know, gym, working out together. Everybody is uh, pitching for new equipment for the gym, everybody is pitching for new parking, everybody is discussing the other uh, rival organization that uh, wasn't good with, to their customers. He's the only one who is uh, taking a different position. And how long can that last? And I would not uh, mark Hungary as a whole here. I would say Hungary as a majority, there are people with Eurocentric understanding of the place of the world in history. They're liberals uh, and they're in very difficult uh, situation with uh, the ruling party that was elected. We understand what Hungary stands on. If you continue claiming that for uh, the interests of Hungary, of every Hungarian citizen, you are doing as much as you can, you're just wasting yourself at the job fighting for the interests. Of course, you can cause some sympathy uh, with your voters, but the feeling of your uh, full pockets uh, is a very volatile feeling, especially when you get cut off from Russian resources. And measuring the whole dynamics of this situation, I think Orban's uh, political power is getting more and more isolated and it's getting weaker. Europe was pointing out, uh, bringing that up to everybody's attention times and times again that Hungary is uh, wrong in their position politically and Poland uh, actually attacked Hungary on their position in such stern words that even Ukraine didn't. Despite uh, some hostile actions that uh, ruling coalition in Hungary uh, did towards our country. And another question that remains open is what will happen? Would there be any investigation of his personal accounts and personal uh, different corruption cases after he's out of power? because uh, there is a strong probability that uh, he does have quite a bit of support financial with routes leading to Moscow and uh, operations starting as early as 90s uh, of the last century. And I think sooner or later Orban and his uh, party will go into resignation and what will conclude that? Will it be imprisonment or will it be uh, just a serious inv investigations? Uh, we'll see. Amazingly, very often political powers that work with Putin end up being very corrupt and very bought, purchased by Kremlin. I don't think that Hungary will be a happy exception to that trend, because uh, standing for the interest they are, I don't believe they're crystal clear in their background and uh, in their shadow books. Remember his main voting that he voted against? He voted against sanctions. He voted against uh, implementing sanctions uh, on uh, Russian nuclear industry. Oh yeah, this is the last story. Sanctions against uh, Rosatom, Russian nuclear, uh, crucial. And then the Yermak, uh, who is leading this agenda in Ukraine, who understands clearly that alongside with oil and gas, one of the key industries for Russia that brings uh, a lot of dollars to their budget is uh, nuclear industry. And sanctions against Russian nuclear is a case of honor, as Andrei Ermak said for him. And everybody was, were in support, there was a lot of diplomatic work, and then all of a sudden Hungary says no. So when they'll get down to investigating deep pockets of Urban's government, 
and their uh, relations with uh, income from oil uh, storage and oil sales. There'll be a lot of interesting facts coming out, I'm quite sure. You know, Alexei, I brought this question up for a reason. There are some presidents here and there in Europe that once in a while state weird things, like president of Croatia recently made a post a statement against uh, sanctions for Moscow, even though the prime minister and others are for it. Uh, Turkey once in a while making statements about Sweden and Finland. We'll talk about uh, Turkey. Uh, but look, for example, Germany, as many people thought, is the most corrupt, maybe not exactly money in the pocket, but definitely engaged with the uh, Russian Federation. Let's use the engaged uh, verb here in uh, regards to oil and other energy resources supplied by Russia before this war. And people are saying that this stuff cannot change quickly. People are saying that this can be uh, changed. Uh, th th this will need years to change. And what do we see? In about a year, Germany got itself off the natural gas pipe needle and they nationalized two major companies which were used for laundering that dirty money for European politicians, which were really corrupt. Um, you know, when I was little, my family was, uh, the family I was growing up in knew quite a bit about politics. And I remember conversations when they were building a gas pipe, Samara Ushgarat and so, when they were talking about new pipes being laid. And this was internal conversations in my family and their friends that the goal of the Communist Party was different. The, they are saying that the West thinks that our goal is to make money. No, our goal is to make them totally dependent on our gas and oil and to have the generations of their politicians grow on our money, on our oil money, and who'd be dependent upon our funds and wouldn't even understand. Uh, it would be so natural for them that they wouldn't even consider that they're uh, being controlled. And they, uh, at those times, there was, we, people in Soviet Union were saying that the completion of these projects were in the 1990s. Exactly so, Alexei. These projects actually did appear after the known uh, energy crisis. The Judgment Day, right? The Judgment Day War in 1974, right? So, and that's when the price went up to $200 per barrel. Those dollars back in the day, that, those are crazy prices. So, of course, looking at that, Moscow was uh, attempting to increase their influence and uh, mining of natural resources. And they had global goals of a different level and they they built these pipelines. Mark 2014, Maidan, and then annexation of Crimea, the trouble in the east, the beginning of war that uh, Russian Federation started to take away Donbass region and the fights near Ilovaisk, hundreds of military and uh, civilians who were killed in those days. Mr. Orban at that day made a decision to, uh, that year, made a decision to build a nuclear reactor in Hungary. And Hungary being a member of uh, NATO, right? People were expecting them to give an, any remark about the annexation of Crimea. And he could have chosen French for uh, his nuclear project. They're specialists. He could have subscribed to American specialists as well. Americans can build that after annexation of Crimea. But he signs a contract for $10 billion with Putin's Russia. So if Hungarian party will investigate this contract, I think they may find some interesting streams there. These are concrete examples of all that corruption. Now regarding Turkey, there were some pessimistic statements, especially from Sweden, that uh, negotiations are stopped because of the events of the several weeks. We understand that uh, there is ultra-right radicals burning Quran and who offended uh, Muslim countries, including Turkey, and Erdogan is in the election campaign race there, which are to happen on the 14th of May, I think. He moved them to a month earlier. 
because opposition has issues with providing a single candidacy, so he is trying to make it tight for them. The sooner the elections, the weaker his opponents will be, which uh, will force them to negotiate faster, and uh, yeah, they'll, they'll face some hurdles. So he's playing a an role of a Turkish leader who is uh, preserving Turkish and Muslim interests, and it's task to for him to take a stern position because negotiations about F-16s are still ongoing and uh, providing that to Ukraine. And Erdogan was always playing on interesting angles in Europe. He doesn't even mind to to take a opposing position to Europe often in order to get some benefits for Turkey. I think Europeans are looking at that um, through a prism of two events. First, if he wins, he'll probably be more negotiable. And second, if he loses, uh, then it might be easier because his opposition is more liberal. And I think we understand that Swedish and Finnish statements today is a part of that uh, under carpet uh, political struggle that uh, was leaked into the public space. And in, in general, I think they're indicating that the price for Erdogan's uh, ambitions is unacceptable for the bloc in general, and that means that he needs to get a message. Um, so there is a political process happening, which many people do not understand. That democracy is a bloody fight where most means are okay. And of course, we grew up in a totalitarian society, so if the party ordered to do something, you just have to go and do. We had no experience of political fights of two opposing parties. We're just learning uh, that me mechanism. And sometimes we're surprised at uh, how hard this fighting can get with some politicians. But in the West, it's the fight of opinions, it's the fight of different strategies. And the, it is not customary to just shut and muzzle uh, people who are opposing you. In some cases, they can be in a status of prime minister. So the general tradition is to publicly oppose uh, that point of view, to prove causation, consequences, and everything. And that all takes time. Each of these conversations takes time. And in civilizational development, this is a much more beneficial civilizational strategy than uh, the totalitarian one. I'm forgetting who uh, said that, but one of the Athens citizens, after their victory over Persians in Marathon, Back then, it was like if Russia invaded Moldova and Moldavia would have won. So Greece, uh, compared to Persia in those days, was nothing. They had a couple of cities and maybe some Spartans. So it was a complete uh, miracle. And it wasn't like in that movie uh, where 300 Spartans were fighting the those uh, wild Persians. No, it was different, right? It was allegory. Uh, even Plato describing the situation uh, was talking that Greeks have a lot to learn from Persian civilization. Persian civilization was doing well. They had a thousand year old empire with a large cultural diversity with a lot of experience of managing different projects, uh, scientific, political, uh, military training, almost inconquerable army, a lot of advantages. But Greeks win. Pericle. Pericle, uh, Pericles, who made this statement. And um, the speech says, why did we win? And that was the core of the West in that speech. We won but because, despite of all the toughness of Persia, he gives them a lot of praise. He's saying they're playing at a much higher level with a good strategic uh, disposition and good military operation. They have one disadvantage compared to us. All that machine is working to realize the will of one man, and one man can be wrong. Moreover, one man is usually wrong. Despite how genius he is, he will always make mistakes, because he is just one man. And we have everything a little bit different. Right now, here next to me in Athens, there is a pro-Persian party. 
Athens are fighting Persia and uh, that we do have a pro-Persian group in our midst and we are making our decisions collectively in tough fighting in a system of transferring translating it to the modern day language in a system of artificially created conflicts where you cannot relax because doing anything are we making a new road to the marketplace are we paving over a puddle it is always a fight with argumentation uh, way to convince your opponents and it's the fight of, of doing that among people who are trained to do the same and back in the day there was a, the whole culture was to to talk to discuss to prove and the whole idea of how to fight Persia is also being discussed in the same manner so of course sometimes we can be wrong because even collective opinion sometimes makes mistakes but in general our approach is much more is much stronger is much more forward-looking because this allows us to prove our right fighting with much stronger opponents because it allows us to develop much stronger solutions much stronger decisions in all kinds of development science military political and uh, if we look back now what was that uh, the battle at marathon Greeks are just getting from the archaics they're uh, they're just uh, budding new civilization the Greece that we know the Greece of Plato will come only hundred years later and the eternal force of the West is in that it acts slower than uh, despotic governments who can just give an order and throw resources at that in the West they still discuss with different figures uh, different sides of that conversation when the ones that we would look at and say why do you even let him be at the table they still negotiate they still hear each other out but we see how in a framework of one year just one year this strategy bared fruit and here we have a similar situation where one person is making decisions in Russia who is being told that this will not work like that by his expert but he's still insisting and the system on the West that takes a while to negotiate that takes a while to make sure everybody is on board but when the first F-16s will strike Putin's positions in Ukraine I think the eternal power of the West will become more visibly understandable to everybody just like when it was when the first Heimers hit the front and this is why Urban can do what he is doing and why sooner or later what he is doing will be over with we've been live for 52 minutes uh, over 300 thousands are watching us uh, 100 thousand plus click the like button please continue guys to share like and subscribe if you have not done that yet to Fagin Live to Alexei Rostovich and to the privateer station if you are listening to that in English the last piece for today not even for discussion just a blip on the radar about uh, the health condition of Mikhail Saakashvili still in prison in Georgia his uh, mother visited him with uh, his attorney and his uh, friends from his party sent me a message saying that COVID is confirmed with Mikhail he is having arthritic pains and or pains in uh, his uh, joints and uh, his foot aches to a degree that he can't even walk himself and until until uh, the heavy metals are, and poisonous elements are being completely cleansed from his body he'll probably not get better as a result of a previous poisoning and his weight now is 69 kilograms he continues to lose weight so this is a three hour old information two hours we've been warning georgian government for a while we cannot push it further any longer i don't see there is a reason to interact with the embassies of georgia they don't want to listen to us so we'll approach from a different direction will affect uh, people who are making decisions on the west and who can provide political pressure 
those whom Georgia still considers to be allies and whom they align the interests with. So we'll prepare a new action. Please follow our streams. We'll uh, start uh, working out the details of that step. And I think we'll do that next step. And it'll be rather painful for the leadership of Georgia if they're not reacting. And it's been enough time since our previous action on the 4th of January. So if nothing is happening, we have to continue to repeat that uh, action. I think they are in the wrong that they're not following our advice. They should have sent him to treatment out of uh, his his height is uh, six and a half feet and he's what, 69 kilos, uh, 130 pounds. Okay, 150 maybe. Um, but still, it's important for us to have you guys support this action, so we'll uh, keep you informed as what we'll do. And let's try to convince them, but not uh, Georgian government, but uh, the governments of uh, other countries, the governments of France, some government, uh, government officials in the United States, uh, Gov uh, Britain, Germany, current president of Georgia, Zrabishvili, has some French roots, so uh, we'll try to uh, take that angle. If they are not uh, ready to do such a humanitarian concession as to release uh, Saakashvili for medical treatment to a third country, so we'll continue working that. All right, Alexei, see you on Tuesday, right? We we'll have some time to strategize. Thank you very much uh, for being with us today. Thank you, dear viewers. As always, subscribe, click the like button. See you.